hello. I'm just headed out of Hill City here, but uh, Hill City, South Dakota. But Hill City is sort of uh, spread out, let's say. Uh, but I'm going to pull into the Hill City Winery, and then I'm going to head out on Highway 385. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get into demographics here in a second, but I just thought I would mention this is uh, an illustration of a rural community that's growing. And the reason it's growing is, of course, tourism. And that plays into the topic of this video quite a lot. Um, I'm going to be talking tonight about kind of the his history of rural de demographics. And one of the interesting things about rural communities is that some have thrived, some have not. And uh, what I am finding through my research is that even though I've lived in rural America my entire life, I don't know as much about it as I thought I did. Um, so um, when you find that these videos are appearing more sporadically, that would be why. I, I just, <laughs> uh, my research is turning up the, well, okay, so when you go into a research project, by the way, pulling into the Hill City Winery here, which is always worth a visit, uh, just make sure you bring some cash. <laughs> but anyway, I, uh, I will just say that go into a research project like this, or any other, with an open mind. Uh, yes, you can't help but have some opinions or ideas of your own. That, that's human nature. But, be open to the research. What does the research you're running into say? And it may say something quite different from what you expect. And you just need to be open to that. And that's what is going on with this video. Uh, and that's why it's taking me longer to film all this. So, anyway, I was in the Hill City Winery, had lunch, bought way too much wine, and now I'm headed out on the road. Uh, one other big point to keep in mind is that the United States is a big place. So when I say rural... A lot of what I'm going to do, unless I say otherwise, is going to be more general trends. And your specific rural area may be different from this. Um, it's uh, some rural areas like mine experience shrinkage up until the oil boom. Uh, other rural areas have shrunk and grown. Other rural areas have just continued to grow. So I'm going to be a little bit more general today. And I think I've mentioned that before, uh, just that the rural United States is more interesting than the media might lead you to believe. A um, little bit of opinion here, but one thing you have to be careful of with um, mainstream media is they really want to appear neutral, which sounds good on its surface, I, I'll concede. Uh, but the trouble is they feel like both sides have to be equally represented. There has to be a villain, there has to be a good guy, or you know something like that, just so they can achieve balance. And the trouble with that is sometimes you miss reality. Now, truthfully, um, well, I'll, I'll just get into it here. Uh, but I'm turning onto Highway 385 and look at the magnificent Black Hills behind that gas station there, which I think I'm pulling into the gas station for gas. All right, so uh, through most of human history, of course, the majority of people were employed in the food industry. And by that I mean finding food for everybody to eat. Hunters, gatherers, farmers, ranchers... Um, you know, you go way far enough back, we were all hunter-gatherers. Uh, the advent of agriculture is what really allowed people to specialize more and uh, feed more people. But even so, until the 20th century, most people were engaged in the business of agriculture because they just, there was a limit on how much food they could produce. And uh, so a lot of people were needed for agriculture. 
So um, what you will find through most of human history is most people lived in a rural setting where they could farm. But the growth of rural populations began to slow down in the 1920s. Now keep in mind, that car didn't disappear, I, that's after I gassed up there. <laughs> um, keep in mind that industrialization started to occur before the 1920s, but its effects really weren't felt in rural population until the 1920s. Now, I would just say that uh, when the rural population began to slow down, what I mean is the rural population's growth rate. The reality is, here in the United States, rural America has continued to grow in population, but the rate at which it was growing slowed down. And yes, places like most of North Dakota shrank, but other rural areas grew. So on the whole, the growth rate declined. Now there were a couple, lot of reasons for this. Uh, one of the reasons was the change in uh, farm equipment. By the way, we're on Highway 385 now. Um, we, we're starting to head into more mechanized farming, uh, threshing machines, later combines and such, uh, less animal power, less people power. In fact, uh, one of these days, I was going to actually take you to a threshing show this fall, but I had the choice to go to Mandan, watch a cross-country meet, and buy some shoes, or stay here and watch a threshing show, and I was just like, yeah, <laughs> went to Mandan. Um, so technology was one of the reasons. Um, another thing that was happening was the end of the First World War, and, you know, I'm not a historian by any means, but I think uh, you could almost call the First World War the end of... America's innocence. I hate to call us America. I prefer United States and I just did it. Uh, but anyway, kind of the end of United States innocence. Uh, we, we transitioned from a largely r rural nation to something else during the First World War. Uh, we got to see the horrors of war. Not like Europe did, but enough. Uh, and a lot of our soldiers, of course, got to go over to Europe, travel far beyond than they ever would have traveled without the war. And I don't mean it sound like I think that war is a good thing, because, yipe, that was a hellhole to be fighting in the First World War. But, uh, anyway, they got to see parts of the world they never would have seen. These are people who probably would have stayed on the farm their whole lives in their small towns and just never would have gotten out. Um, I'll put a link here. Nora Bays is just one person who sang this song. She just happens to be the one I found. Uh, how do you keep them down on the farm? And then it continues on once they've seen Paris. You know, they, they got to see that there is a much larger world out there. Much larger than their small rural community. And remember, it's not like now. There was no internet. Radio even was in its infancy. They were very isolated on these small towns. Their, you know, roads were awful. Travel just was not a thing. So it was an awakening. You know, it, it was awake, an awakening in a lot of ways. The hell of the First World War was also an awakening. Uh, you read some of uh, Ernest Hemingway's works, like The Sun Also Rises, and he he'll he'll get more into people living with the aftermath of that war. Uh, Hemingway, Hemingway, sorry, also wrote another book uh, called Farewell to Arms, which actually dealt with the war itself. Um, trying to remember now, it's been a number of years since I read it, but I remember there was an ambulance driver in it. And Anyway, he got quite a bit into the hell of war, and uh, people questioning, is it all really worth it? We have made a big deal here in the United States about... I don't know, almost sanctifying the people that fought in the Second World War. We call them the greatest generation. Um, I think we don't pay a lot of attention to those who fought in the First World War. Um, sometimes called the silent generation. These are uh, people who faced hell. I mean... Uh, I, you know, I will admit there's an interest there in the First World War on my part. But, uh, you know, study trench warfare. Oh, my God. 
But anyway, to get back to the topic of the video, I'm sorry, I sailed completely off the edge of the earth there. And to get back to the topic of the video, uh, these are rural communities where there may not have even been electricity. I mean, I know a woman who, she's in her 60s, I don't know her exact age because she won't tell me, but uh, she grew up on a farm near here, in fact, uh, I've been in the house she grew up in, uh, and I noticed a windmill by her house, she doesn't live there now, her uh, relatives do, but I noticed a windmill right beside it that I just thought, that looks kind of funny, so I asked about her husband about it, and he pointed out that the windmill actually used to be a generator up until the 1950s because they had no electricity they had uh, batteries in their basement the windmill would charge the batteries so they could run a few lights and uh, maybe mom could run her iron although she probably did that on a stove uh, maybe dad could listen to the radio for a little bit no these they grew up without electricity uh, I helped a rewiring project in an old building from what was it 1914 uh, it had gotten its first electric wires in the 1950s. So I helped with uh, replacing the, that wiring. I mean, wow. 1950s and they still had no electricity. That was a reality in a lot of parts of rural United States. Um, probably in the towns it came before that. But, you know, I, I used to own a house that was built in the 1920s. Had knob and tube wiring. It was... I would guess it had wiring in the 1920s, but it also had a cistern. And there was a hole, if you went under the kitchen sink, you didn't see it in the kitchen sink, but if you went down the basement looked up, there was a big hole under the kitchen sink. And it made you realize that, wow, what was it connected to? Well, the cistern. <laughs> they got their water from the cistern. So there was a pipe for either roof drainage to go into the cistern or uh, I'm guessing maybe trucks would come around if it was dry and fill these cisterns I don't know but uh, yeah this is a different world and uh, you know current day United States people think rural areas are backward but huh, I mean seriously <laughs> look at other countries and look how it was here a few decades ago Rural United States is nowhere near as backwards as the stereotype. Uh, now I'm going to mention one other thing uh, before I get into the demographics. Back in college I first read a book by F. Scott Fitzgerald called The Great Gatsby. Uh, when we talk about life in rural America, we're really not talking about the people in Great Great Gatsby. We're not talking about swingers. We're not talking about any of that. It's a different world. Um, in fact, if I remember right, and it's been two or three years since I last read the book, Gatsby himself was originally from either North or South Dakota. Um, the scene in the book didn't make much impact on me, but if you've ever seen the movie by, with uh, starring Robert Redford as Gatsby, the way the actor who played his father dealt with his death is just kind of, wow. Very, very powerful in a movie that kind of missed a lot of notes. And, and in fairness, I don't know if you can make a good movie out of that book. That's kind of a book that is better as a book than perhaps a movie. I know there's a newer movie uh, starring, shoot, the kid that was in Titanic. Um, drawing a blank and I might have to pause and look up his name. Sorry, Leonardo DiCaprio. So anyway, I haven't seen that version so I won't comment on it. But uh, to get back to the story, so uh, rural United States was not that world. Gatsby was trying to escape it. A lot of people tried to, and there were more and more of them trying to escape it back then. But, even though we had migration, rural to urban migration, because of, you know, agriculture getting more mechanized, people wanting to see this bigger world and live in this bigger world, rural America didn't shrink overall. There was just natural replacement 
you know, a lot of the people, my contemporaries and older, grew up in large families with sometimes 16 siblings. Um, so, yeah, there, there wasn't a shrinkage in rural America the way you might hear because people were replacing themselves. But the thing is, the urban areas grew more quickly. Now, of course, within that, we have to face, there was a kind of a net migration out of the Northeast and Midwest, and they were heading West. Um, another thing, uh, actually, I should also mention, in the 1980s, they were leaving the South also, but in the 19, but then in the 1980s, they, people started moving to the South as well. So uh, that's kind of a weird little thing. But uh, another thing we're seeing is cities expanding into formerly er, um, rural areas around them. Uh, that's the formation of the suburbs. And here I'm just going to mention a couple of little things. One of them is Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. I may have mispronounced that, but anyway, this guy was interested in a house. Basically, I think he had the idea of tearing it down. But as he started to work on it, he discovered that this junky old house, buried under a layer of stucco, was a log cabin. As he uh, worked on it further, he found out that, holy cow, this is a log cabin. A pioneer log cabin. This is a thing that was built back in the day when it was surrounded by forest. You know, we're talking 1700s. Of course, now you look at that part of Pennsylvania, it is a city. But not when this house was built. Uh, so, of course, now it's a museum, and it may well be the oldest surviving house in Pennsylvania. And it's just kind of cool, because what a different world the house was built in. Um, of course, city grew up around it, and uh, that's what's happened to a certain percentage of rural locations. And I suppose now is a good point time to point out that uh, I'm getting a lot of my information from a University of New Hampshire study about uh, demographic changes in rural and small town America. There's the word America again. Um, but anyway, so there was a migration out of rural America but it continued to grow slowly. Urban areas grew more quickly till the 1970s. Um, in the 1970s, 80% of rural counties actually gained population. In fact, the rate exceeded the growth in population of metropolitan areas. Now, uh, of course, it was fueled by people leaving the cities. Um, I will sort of include my father. He, he grew up in, uh, I won't be too specific because it's his private life. Uh, but let, let's just say... New Jersey, where he could see the Empire State Building, where he used to go duck hunting. And, uh, anyway, he, he moved to rural Pennsylvania in the 1960s, where he met my mother, who grew up in rural Pennsylvania. And they have lived happily forever after in rural Pennsylvania. Yay. But, uh, so he, I guess he was a little early on the trend. But people like him. Um, the rate slowed down really quickly in the 80s and 90s. Well, you know, you kind of look at some of the books. Uh, some of these books about country living, for example. That's a title. Uh, the I'm sorry, the full title is The Encyclopedia of Country Living. Uh, books like this um, were, were part of supporting this movement, Back to the Land. Uh, another set of books that came out at this time was the Foxfire books, which incidentally came about due to a high school project. Foxfire books, of course, looked at Southern Appalachian culture, which was rural. Um, so there's a lot of romanticization of the of the rural culture and uh, a lot of people going back to the land and so on. And I, I think some of this followed from the hippies of the 60s wanting to follow their dreams. Uh, but it slowed down, of course, in the 80s and 90s, but it didn't return to its former trend of a very slow growth. Uh, now, one thing we've seen now, although 
the rate of people moving back to the land slowed down to 80s and 90s. Didn't return to its former trend, but rural birth rates have dropped. Now, rural decline is not as drastic as it used to be, but uh, one of the things going on there, which I think I mentioned in my last video, is migration. We do have people moving to rural areas, but it's a ticking time bomb because it's age selective. Younger people leave rural areas. And I know that because I teach them. <laughs> um, it's the older people that are returning. And the 1970s were different. A lot of young people were, were moving to the rural areas in the 1970s. And what this means is there are a lot fewer rural births and an aging population. I haven't probably mentioned... No, I did mention this. I took you on a walk around my town. Our old hospital closed and was replaced by a newer building. Um, the old hospital had a uh, maternity ward. Now, when I say maternity ward, I should probably call it a maternity closet because it wasn't much. Um, one of my colleagues actually gave birth to both of her children there. Um, this would have been 25 years ago or so. Not too long after that, it, uh, it closed officially. Uh, they, they no longer deliver babies at the hospital where I live. Because there just aren't enough to support a maternity ward and all the equipment needed. I heard my fan get a little frisky there on the laptop. But anyway, so yeah, the maternity ward is closed. And you'll find that in a lot of rural communities because our birth rates have dropped. Yes, there are large families around. Most of them are not. We're getting a lot more like urban areas. We are having smaller families. Uh, and of course, with not young people moving in, but older people, okay, they may be bringing their kids with them because a lot of them are families looking for a better life. I mean, I knew a guy once, I won't say the state, but he moved from a interesting state to North Dakota uh, with his family. And his whole idea was, you know, I just would like it if my son could go play in the backyard without us having to be out there with him. Um, and that might be another, you know, perception of crime might be another a topic for another video. So I, you know, I'm just going to take him at his word that it was so crime-ridden where he lived in that particular state that he didn't dare let his son play in the backyard. So he moved to a rural community and bought a, well, a local business. And he and his wife and his son put up with a uh, much lower income in order to hopefully have a better lifestyle. Um, but we have a smaller families. Rural America has an aging population. And what this means is the rate of natural increase is finally declining in rural America. And I would just suggest to you, you know, and, and admittedly, North Dakota was ahead on this trend. People have been bailing out of North Dakota all along and population has been dropping until the oil boom. And now it's dropping again. But walk my hallways. Walk the hallways of any school I've ever taught at. I've taught at four in North Dakota. Look at the graduation pictures because yes, at our schools we put up our pictures of our seniors. The classes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This year, my high school, where I teach, is going to graduate 21 kids. This will be the smallest school, sorry, the smallest class we have graduated since the, the teens, the 19 teens. Smallest class we've graduated in 100 years. Now, yes, thanks to oil and a few other things, because our town has a little bit going for it, um, we do have some bigger classes coming. This will be the smallest class, and then they will get bigger again. But they're never they're not at the peak they were. I mean, we are a school that at one time would graduate close to 100 kids. Our largest class right now is 40-something kids. We're, sh we're shrinking. And you know, that's a reality of rural America. As I said, North Dakota was just ahead on the trend. 
Um, it's coming. This demographic wave. Now, I will point out that some areas, rural areas, are experiencing different phenomena than others. Uh, you visit this part of South Dakota, it's growing. But, I mean, I mean, seriously, take a look here. This is paradise. I mean, hell, I'd move down here if, if I could make money teaching in, in this area. I mean, who doesn't want to live in this? I, uh, I love the Black Hills. Now, what the Black Hills have going for them is tourist amenities. Other areas that are growing are areas close to cities. Um, I wouldn't want to teach at some of the schools that border the cities in North Dakota uh, because what they face is, first of all, they get a lot of the rejects from the city schools. You, know, you get expelled from Fargo. Oh, where are you going to go? Oh, let's find a small school around there that probably can't hire fancy lawyers. Um, another thing you face is people who limited income who move into these towns and can live in the cities which I have no problem with that because those are people that are actually trying to make their lives better um, but they're the reason that these areas are growing uh, you also get in those towns one of the things I don't like is teachers who live in the city go teach in the small town because it's so darn cute but they have no loyalty to it because they live in the city and hell, some of them, let's be honest, are teaching in the small town while living in the city because their goal is to build up their resume to the point they can get a job in the city where they live. Because a lot of young people just do not want to teach in a small town. They want to get into a city school. And let's face it, most of the city schools here in North Dakota pay better than the rural schools. Well, they better because their rents are higher. Um... You will also get people who live in these small towns, go teach or work in the city, and then come back home to the small town. So it's kind of like a bedroom community. And it's uh, even worse in larger areas. Now, where I live, we're pretty far away from everything, so we're not a bedroom community. Nobody lives in my town as a bedroom community. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that, but... A lot of people that did were, you know, they'd go work for a week somewhere else and come back. Uh, so very, I should say very few live here as a bedroom community. So we're pretty much grow your own. But we really struggle to find employees for the school, for the hospital, for any of the businesses in town. Because nobody wants to live out in a rural community. And, of course, I'm not giving you a citation for that because that's my personal experience. Um, you know, I, if you question, I challenge you to just talk to the superintendent or the principals where uh, I teach and ask them how easy it is to hire somebody, even in elementary. You know, we just can't find people. So, um... Uh, yeah, there's just a lot, not a lot of amenities. So earlier when I brought up uh, Great Gatsby and I mentioned about Paris, you know, that's, that's a big thing with rural areas. They don't have what cities have. Yes, the internet doesn't make you quite as isolated as you used to be. I mean, I can buy things that I wouldn't have been able to buy in a former day and age, although Sears Robot Catalog used to be kind of a big thing to rural areas. Um, you don't have the entertainment options in rural communities. Uh, you have to be a lot better at entertaining yourself. Um, and, and I think when I get into some of the other demographics of rural areas in future videos, that's going to explain some of it. You know, why are rural areas typically more religious than uh, more metropolitan metropolitan or urban areas well because a church is a social outlet in an area where there aren't a lot of social outlets 
Church is a chance to meet up, eat somebody else's food, maybe listen to music, you know, fellowship. Whereas in a larger area, there are other outlets. Um, I'm going to get into education, so I'll uh, leave that bear alone for now. I'll get into religion. But I think we're on the brink of rural America looking quite a lot different. Let the science fiction writer just jump in here for a brief moment. I'm just going to point out that I think our cities are going to look a lot different too. All this online shopping, online socializing, kind of like what you're seeing right now, that's changing our human relationships. Uh, it's closing local businesses. It's uh, shutting down that interest in visiting with your neighbor because you can find that cool guy on YouTube that travels North Dakota. Okay, maybe not so cool, but you know, you get what I mean. Um, and it substitutes for real human relationships, real human stores. And uh, that's a larger topic that probably deserves its own video. But I think one of the topics I need to explore in my next few videos is uh, you know, what rural areas are succeeding and which ones are shrinking. Hello, North Dakota, shrinking here, uh, but there are some that are growing. So uh, let's explore that in the next video because I think I've beaten this topic to death. Uh, more uh, Black Hills scenery to come, of course, and... Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly where this will wrap up. Like I said uh, at the beginning of this, I started this with a certain agenda and topics and a an out vague outline in mind. And doggone if the research just didn't match up to what I expected to say. So I don't know exactly where I'm going to head. And I feel a little uncomfortable about that. Usually when I start a series like this, I... Oh, that was a weird jump. I don't know why it was a jump. But anyway, I, usually when I start a series like this, I know where I'm headed. And I don't know that anymore. And it makes me really uncomfortable. And uh, so, yeah, it, you're welcome to continue on the journey with me. And uh, we will be going up the main street and lead during this series and uh, down Spearfish Canyon the opposite direction from which I usually come and uh, yeah I don't know where I'll end it up so yeah I, I, I'm sounding really tentative and lost right now because I am I just uh, I don't know what I'm going to put up next week or if I will do some more research on my planned topic for next week and say Oh, I need another week yet to research. So, yeah. So, I'm hoping you're finding this at least moderately interesting. Uh, I, my real hope is it's giving you something to think about. And we'll see you later. Bye-bye.